Are Take it away. Oh, thank you. Hi. <laughs> ah, so, hi. I like to start my talks off with a little bit of levity. And I now realize that the words are a little hard to see with the, the lighting on the screen, but luckily the words on the slide won't be all that important, mostly things that I say. Um, but yeah, so this talk is about uh, what it's like to be laid off. Um, quick question, although let me finish it and then I'll ask you all to raise hands. Um, have you been laid off, watched a friend or a teammate be laid off, or interviewed someone who has been laid off? Raise your hands. Yeah, okay, so we got a lot of common experiences um, in this room, and so this talk is about what that experience could look like. Um, specifically, I'll share some of my own specific experiences, some advice on how to support each other. Um, as we or people we know kind of go through this experience because I think someone mentioned yesterday our industry is changing and I don't think it's going to stop changing. So um, who am I? Um, so this is fun because usually in the past when I've given talks at tech conferences, I name drop maybe companies or people that prove that like oh, I'm technical. Um, but this talk is not about that really, so I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm going to tell you how human I am. <laughs> um, so I have a lot of soap boxes, um, and you'll hear a few of them in this talk. I think one is in like two slides. Um, so that'll, that'll happen. I'm very passionate, and I research way too much, and I have opinions. Um, I'm extremely authentic. I'm very bad at poker. <laughs> um, and that also is going to be very evident in this talk. Now, I'm going to share some things that are pretty um, like deeply personal. Um, however, I'm sharing them because I want us all to kind of recognize the humanity in a process like layoffs, which are inherently dehumanizing, um, and you know, form a basis to relate to each other. So I'm not asking for sympathy per se, right, or pity or whatever for what I share, but just kind of using that as the um, maybe commiseration or you know equal support, um, whatever. However, I will ask for sympathy for one thing, um, which is this. So I moved to Delaware a few years ago, and we're here in the Rockies, and I think a lot of y'all live in Colorado, so you'll understand this. This random bench in a random park by a random sidewalk is the highest point in Delaware. So, I'll take that. It's, it's hard, it's hard, I'm not gonna lie. Um, okay, one last little soapbox, or I guess the first soapbox. I love systems. I'm sure many of you here can understand that love. How do they work? How do they connect and operate? Um, these are a variety of books about systems. Um, data intensive applications are one type of system. Our lives are another type of system, right? When we look at maybe how to <laughs> react to being laid off or what have you, approach it like a system, right? It's a system design problem. Um, thinking in systems, it's fantastic. Um, and then this one is kind of unique. Can I? Ah, yeah. Oh, it's, yes, very hard to read. Um, it's called The Path Between Us. It's actually a book about the Enneagram, which you may recognize that term because it had a big pop culture moment a few years ago. The pop culture moment was very annoying <laughs> because it was extremely simplified. Um, but essentially this and other kind of systems similar to it, it's a way of understanding people, right? because people are systems. Our brains are computers. We talk about neural pathways and repairing them or rewiring our brains, right? Or taking medication that can help fix broken pathways. So our brains are systems, people, how we connect with each other are systems, um, and that is all part of it. I also have a soapbox about um, ADHD, but maybe won't spend too much time on that right now, but see me after. Um, okay, so on to the topic of the talk. Um, Layoffs used to be temporary, um, now they're not. And as they have progressed, it's been quite fun. Um, all of the terms around layoffs, again, they're, right, they're inherently dehumanizing, right? I especially love this one, right-sizing. <laughs> Our company was wrong, but we got rid of a bunch of people, now we're right, we're good. <laughs> like, thanks. Um, this term, though, displaced workers, I find this very interesting because it's almost like half dehumanizing and then half actually very humanizing. So the workers part is very dehumanizing, right? It, it 
diminishes the value of a person to your identity as a worker. Oh, you're a worker. You don't have a place to work right now, but you'll find a new one because you're a worker. That's what you are, right? That's your identity. Um, so dehumanizing. But displaced is very humanizing. If you look at where the word displaced is used, it's usually used with like refugees who are forced out of um, their home, right? A place that they know and they're familiar with, and they often don't have a choice in the matter. Um, so this concept of choice is a big theme of what we're talking about here, right? Um, and it's a big part of what makes layoffs so dehumanizing is because when you don't have choice, when you don't have autonomy or the ability to have a say in what happens to you, that sucks. <laughs> that's really hard. Um, that's really hard. So as the talk of my title alludes to, it was kind of inspired by this concept of the five stages of grief. Um, now, someone came up with this very linear list, um, and I think more people are realizing that grief is not linear, actually, um, but this is still a very commonly recognized list. Um, and then I found um, an IO psychologist who took this list and applied it to layoffs, but I found it interesting the way he did it. So IO psychology stands for like industrial organizational psychology, so it's the psychology of companies and how they select employees and keep them motivated and all of that. Um, so he took bargaining out of it um, and then he replaced depression with fear. Which I just found like, oh, so you're acknowledging layoffs have no choice. <laughs> um, and you think people don't get depressed, they just get afraid? Like why not both? I don't know, I just found it interesting that, that he summarized it in this way. Um, but more roughly here though, I do not agree that it's linear. Um, and in fact, 25 years ago, other smart people agreed with me <laughs> that grief is not linear. You're constantly kind of going back and forth of like different stages of being okay, being less okay, being okay, being less okay. And the goal is that over time as you oscillate between the stages of grief, each of the harder stages would gradually lose their power over you, right? Like maybe you start out terrified and over time you're less afraid. Hopefully, that's the goal. Um, but there are always differences because all of us are different and all of our lives are different. Um, so now I'm gonna s jump into talking about my experience of kind of going through these stages and how that might look. Oh, and I guess my notes are on this TV, so come over here. Um, so yeah, stage one, denial. This one is, this one is fun. Um, so let's see, our industry started layoffs, I forget what year, um, but um, for those first like nine to 12 months of the layoffs, I was like, oh, my employer will not do layoffs. I'm safe here, I'm not gonna look for a new job because you know, as soon as the industry layoffs started, um, we like f either froze hiring or reduced it massively or whatever, and I was like, we're good. My company's smart. <laughs> Um, then there was a, a bad uh, raise promotion cycle. And then I was like, okay, so there's gonna be laughs. But probably in like six months because they're gonna give time for people to quit on their own because layoffs are expensive, so wouldn't they wanna save money and give, you know, voluntary leaving. Um, but about three months after that, um, I saw a chat message from a coworker who said, hey, I checked blind today. And they said there's gonna be layoffs. I was like, oh, thought it would be at the end of summer. Okay. And then someone else said, yeah, I, I heard the sign is if you have a random meeting with HR on your calendar. And I said, oh, ha, ha, I guess I should go check. So I checked. <laughs> and I saw the ominous meeting in about 45 minutes. So I called my husband, I'm shaking on the phone. Um, our situation didn't have any redundancy to it. Um, my husband had, his own industry was kind of torn apart by um, the pandemic as well. He had been the stay-at-home parent um, for a couple years. Uh, we actually recently um, welcomed a couple of foster kids into our house, so he spent a lot of time taking them to um, daycare and various things, and then you know job searching um, in a, f a few hours a day. Um, so I was the breadwinner, right? I was not only the breadwinner, but the, uh, the healthcare provider. So this was terrifying. Um, so, you know, shaking, crying on the phone. I think I might be getting laid off. Still holding on to a little bit of denial, like maybe. Um, yeah. 
Um, so the fear, like I mentioned with the healthcare, you know, um, we all have our situations. Some of us are supporting maybe elderly family members, maybe younger family members, or ourselves in our own health situations. Um, my daughter was born with a congenital heart defect, so she has to see her cardiologist, uh, cardiologist regularly for checkups. Um, my husband was also recovering from knee surgery at the time, so I had those checkups going on. Healthcare is a big deal, you know, as it is for all of us. Um, so that was really the bigger fear, honestly, even than income, right? Because, like, there's unemployment checks, at least. Um, and then my last little shred of, I even hate to say hope, because it's like, oh, hopefully someone else is, you know, put in this situation and not me. But I was like, okay, I'm a, I'm a manager at this time. I'm like, maybe the meeting is about people on my team and not me, right? That's the last little shred of denial. So I DM my manager and the other manager on our team, or message them, like, hey, are you all in this meeting too? Is it about our team? Is it about me? Silence. No response. Seconds are ticking by. I'm like, okay, not looking good. Final nail in the coffin of denial was another IC on the team DM'd me and said, hey, my manager, one of the other managers on our, in our team or org, she's an, I'm, I got invited to this meeting. She's not responding. What's going on? I was like, huh? Yeah, we're being laid off, all right. Um, so here's the deal, if you have any brag docs or anything, get them copied over like on your own computer um, and like start prepping because like this is going down. Um, open a DM to the people who directly report to me, say, hey, I'm getting laid off, here's the deal, love working with you, it's been great. Um, and then I learned someone else on my team is getting laid off and I'm like, okay, how deep does this go? <laughs> like in our org, you know, I think we had like 20 people in our, in our little org. So then I, I post publicly in our, in our team's channel, other people, I think it was like five or six of us total, um, you know, pile in and say, oh, me too, me too. Um, and then everyone kind of starts panicking because it's like, holy shit, what? <laughs> um, so we all managed to jump on a Zoom call together to kind of say goodbye, support each other. Um, and it's like the weirdest sort of wake where like the people who are being mourned are like also there. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> So weird vibes. And then we all like, our computers were getting shot off one by one. So we'd be like, oh, there goes mine. Oh, mine just went. Like, okay. <laughs> Trying to keep it like a little lighthearted as we're all freaking out. Um, and then yeah, crisis response too. I, um, I posted in, a, I just went to like all my Slack communities and can't process much at this point, but I'm like, oh, just got laid off. Please send referrals. And that was all I could handle. So. Um, and those messages did collect, you know, a lot of reactees, got started getting DMs throughout the day, which was extremely encouraging to see at that time. Um, so yeah, advice in terms of crisis response. Someone on my team started a quick Google Doc to collect everyone's like contact info on the team so that he could share that with um, those of us who were affected. So that's awesome. Like you can do that. Because um, again, like you know, most of us, if we're working remotely, especially like once your computer gets cut off, how do you? Like, I don't have the phone numbers of my coworkers, you know? Um, so that, that's really great, that's really helpful. Also, like, immediately go to LinkedIn and leave them a reference. And this is important for actually two reasons. One, obviously, will help them in their job search. But two, one of the ways that layoffs fucks with your brain is like, you, or at least I did, I shouldn't project, but I went through, I think I'll talk about this a little more later, this crisis of like, oh, what is my value? Like, was I even worth anything? Did people even care if I was there, right? Um, so that reference can be encouraging in those moments as well. Um, and then yeah, offer whatever help, support you can, referrals, all of that, that I think most people know to do that. <laughs> um, so anger is an interesting stage because it sort of permeates all the other stages and you kind of, it's just always there, like kind of just under the surface a little bit because, you know, as, as I went through my job search process and, you know, the unemployment checks, I'm like, okay, I have this long of a runway and um, all of that. Um, I just get angry, right? Like, why is health insurance tied to employment? Like, that's messed up. Um, I do link an article in the resources slide at the end that talks about why, how we got there, why the system is designed and set up that way. Um, and I was angry that I didn't get to say like the strategic direction of our company, but now that our company's strategic direction was not panning out, I got cut. Like, what? Okay. Um, and I was angry that my family was now suffering because of the mistakes of a few billionaires. The 
that's not fair. So, yeah, anger is always there. Um, oh, wait, hang on. Can I go back? Hold on. Yeah, I'm trying to, okay, no, this is good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the grief of it, oh, I forgot. This is one of my soapboxes. I forgot to say at the beginning. Um, one of my soapboxes here is that I think our society, or, and by that I mean like the, the cultural context that I live in, like generally, um, US, Western, we really struggle with grief. We struggle with processing it and supporting other people in it. We have this desire, I know I struggle with this, if someone tells me, you know, something sad. I'm like, oh, but it's probably good because of this other thing, right? You know, we wanna like quickly move on to the, but it's okay. Um, sitting with discomfort and holding painful emotions and making space for people to not be super happy right now. It's like really hard. Um, and so, yeah, I think, and, and, and viewing, we, I really want more people to view layoffs as like, it is a grief event, right? Like, so treat people who have just gone through a layoff like they just lost a loved pet, right? Or maybe they were in a car accident or recovering from surgery, right? Offer to bring them food. If you don't live in the area, buy them a gift card. Um, it's, they're grieving. Um, for me, <laughs> I reflected later, it's very interesting. I, I kind of felt like I was kidnapped. Like, it was like, all of a sudden you're ripped away from like your friends, <laughs> you know, and like not allowed to talk to them anymore, um, except for that Google Doc that have finally, you know, had all their contact info. Um, and to be clear, like companies are not families, right? Like we all, we know that I think. Um, but the people you work with every day, like they're humans and they're hopefully great <laughs> and you hopefully have fun at work and you know, you support each other like my team, we sing karaoke together. <laughs> you know, we had real and true friendships. We would share vacation photos. Um, we supported each other in a lot of ways amidst the work that we did. And so, um, yeah, the people that I worked with every day. So it, it, it was real and, and, and being ripped away from that community so like violently was difficult to process. Oh, thanks, yeah, sorry, the notes are going down. Make sure I didn't miss anything. Yeah, that's good. Um, so yeah, um, I had a friend local to me who did come by with beer later that day. Um, I drank the beer and she listened to me talk. <laughs> um, and I was externally processing all of these emotions. And then, as I mentioned, right, that struggle to process grief, I was very quick to try to assure her, but I'm not a burden, like you don't have to carry my sadness, it's okay, I'm gonna be fine, right? Like, oh, I'm, I'm optimistic, like I'm getting all these referrals and my DMs, like I'll bounce back quickly, it'll be great. And it's like, why couldn't I just let myself be sad for like a couple hours? I would be forced to sit with that, those feelings, you know, later on. They don't just go away because you paper over them and repress them for a few hours. So, um, yeah. And that sentiment definitely would roller coaster quite a bit over the next um, several months. Of my thankfully, actually, kind of relatively short job search, I know many people have been searching for up to a year, even. Like, it's, it's really, really rough out there. So, it was hard. It was really, really hard. And I'm also grateful that it was, I, yeah. We opened a, a credit card with 18 months of no interest. Lived off that for a few months. It's almost paid off. Doing great. Because, um, yeah, I, I, am, I am employed now. So that's, that's something there. Um, but, yeah, I spent the next couple of days just kind of in shock processing it. Um, in hindsight, I should have given my time. Me, I should have given myself more processing time. Um, but again, being that kind of solo income earner, I felt obviously a lot of pressure to get back out there and, and push myself. Um, so I think bargaining does have a place here. Um, and it has it in two ways. One is kind of historical, like in our the very large layoff cohort that I was a part of, we chatted and some people would say like, oh, I thought, oh, not dissimilar to kind of my denial stage. Um, I thought I was safe because I was part of this thing, right? Or I thought I was safe because I was on this team. So it's kind of like retrospective bargaining. Um, and then there's also, you know, hopefully you have the opportunity for severance and the opportunity for maybe a bit of negotiation. Um, I was given some advice 
um, to use the phrase hardship allowance when asking for additional assistance. Um, and I, based on my experience, I do or recommend always asking, right? It's like negotiating anything. Always ask, why not? Um, however, I was also given advice to be very emotional in my ask, to try to appeal to the humanity of the person making the decisions. The problem with that is that the person that they let talk to you on the phone doesn't have any decision-making power. So it felt like really all I did was trauma dump on someone who also was probably having a shitty day, right? And so I think in hindsight, I would still ask, but I would not be quite as vulnerable as I was in that situation. I think vulnerability is something that we all, you know, I definitely need to practice, but not, not when you are negotiating with a company. Um, so yeah, back to more, more grief. Um, there was a large theme of just like powerlessness, again, related to that lack of choice, lack of autonomy. When I got laid off, I told my kids, which luckily was, hey, we have to cancel Xbox Live for a while, and not, you know, that we have to go to a food bank, so I was grateful for that. Um, and I realized that is, you know, a privileged position as well. Um, a unique struggle with remote work and layoffs is that my office, which now was a gross place, <laughs> uh, was in my home. So I had to avoid this room in my home for, for a little bit. Um, actually, just this weekend, um, someone shared an article that is uh, by someone named Luke Plunkett on The Aftermath, which is, quote, an independent worker-owned website about video games and internet culture. And as I'm sure many of us are aware, video game industry, lots of tumult. And the problem, as was described also in this article, is that people in that industry, their skills are highly specialized. And it's a relatively small industry, so as companies lay people off, there's just like nowhere to go. Because um, the, the industry seems to be like contracting, right? Um, and so there was one quote from a, a guy who was interviewed as part of this article. His name was Chris Orry, I think I'm pronouncing that right. He said, I couldn't even step into my home office without a feeling of dread. I still don't go in there. I've given it to my wife as an exercise room. For me, part of my grieving process was I packed up all my company swag, put it in a box, put it in the garage. It's still there, actually. So I should probably declutter, maybe. I mean, some of it was good. I know you can like remove logos <laughs> from things. <laughs> Need to try that. Like some of it's really like nice stuff, you know? So anyway. Um, so yeah, I want to talk a little bit about like the survivors of a layoff as well. Because um, when you're a survivor, it's like survivor guilt, right? Like maybe you feel guilty that you weren't laid off. Like maybe you, someone was laid off and you're like, oh, they're way better than me. Like what does that mean? You know, am I next? Like, right? So there can be that extra anxiety, extra fear, a little bit of guilt. Um, and sorry, this, my notes are like not quite in order, but it's fine. Um, so understand that like everyone grieves in their own way. So some of your coworkers, maybe they want, want to work more because it distracts them. Maybe they want to work more because they have anxiety about being next and they think that will help. And like, yeah, sure, maybe that's not like a healthy mentality, but it's their coping mechanism and you know, let them be. Some people will need time off to process. All of those are valid ways of grieving and dealing with this situation, <laughs> these emotions. Um, and I think a, a big takeaway here is like, I've, I fully conceptualize in a way that like, I always knew because people talked about it, but I really internally realized like, oh yeah, your, your relationship with your employer is transient and it is a business relationship and you don't have all the control in it. And so like always make sure you're looking out for yourself. Like one struggle that I had is that as I went into interviewing, a lot of companies want to know about what projects you worked on and the hard decisions you had to be made and the discussions that happened. And I couldn't study for those interviews because all those documents were on servers I didn't have access to anymore. And I don't know about you, but I don't remember intimate details of a project I worked on two years ago, <laughs> right? And so it just added another layer of challenge with this. So again, brag docs, et cetera, keep local copies. <laughs> Very important. Um, yeah. Um, depression is an interesting one. I don't necessarily mean clinical depression, so I apologize if I'm misusing this term, but it came from like, you know, the original scale, so put it in here. Although it definitely could become clinical, right, if 
this uh, unemployment continues and the feelings of not being valued continues and the stress of not having an income or healthcare continue, right? Like that, definitely a risk. Um, for me, my kind of struggle here again was, okay, my company didn't want me. As, or, as the interviews continued and the rejections came in, <laughs> okay, this industry doesn't want me. Do I have anything to contribute here? Do I have value? Like, what am I doing? So it's vitally important to rest and reflect prior to and while going through interview processes. Interview processes are also dehumanizing. <laughs> and, and they're getting worse. Like, I remember we were all talking about how terrible they were like five years ago, and like, they got worse. So that's great. Um, but yeah, take, take more breaks than you think you need. I know I did this badly. I got better at it. But um, I was like, oh, I can't miss. If I, if I don't hurry and get through the interview loop, then I'll miss out on the offer. Someone will beat me to it. And I mean, maybe, but also, like, I performed really badly in some interviews because I was exhausted. So you got to take care of yourself. Take more breaks than you think you need. Kind of my go-to advice here is like no more than one interview a day and no more than like two separate companies in a week in terms of like the interviews you're, you're putting up. Because also it's, you got to shift your context, right? You need to be able to prepare well as well. Um, so yeah, I like the, the differentiation here is so grief is something you have and mourning is something you do. So I was carrying grief around through my day to day. Um, and I told my kids that, oh, again, wanting to, silver lining, it's gonna be okay, positivity. I told my kids, oh, when I get a new job, because I will, when I get a new job, we'll have a party. Unintended consequence was that then my four-year-old asked me pretty often, did you get a new job yet? I wanna have a party. So, and she asked this on one particular day with one particularly heartbreaking rejection. Um, and I just collapsed on the floor, on my dog's bed, and I sobbed. And at that time, we had our two biological kids, we had two foster kids. So all, the, all four kids, you know, gathered around me like, what's going on? This, like, the strong person in the house is, we don't know what to do, right? Um, and my husband joins in, my dog. So we, we had a little pity party. Um, and I'm just crying, and I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop. Um, and the kids who could talk asked me, you know, why are you crying? I said, uh, I'm really sad. I'm really stressed right now. I have a lot of stress in my body, and it's coming out. And that happens, because we're human. And then my beautiful soul of a six-year-old hugged me for a while. I eventually stopped. But that was important. I mean, you need to mourn to handle your grief. Mourning is a very important stage. Um, anger again, interviews pissed me off, man. They, okay, companies like, they want perfect specimens of like their checklists, all right? Look, I am not a checklist person. I'm sure most of you are not, right? We don't fit these, these like idealized versions of what a good engineer, the good manager looks like. It's like, look, no, I'm really good at my job. People who work with me love me, right? I'm good at, a lot of things, as are all of you, sometimes it doesn't fit a checklist. And it, I got this sense in talking to other people who have been struggling in this job market over the last year, who've been struggling with post layoffs, it really felt like if you got a 98% on the test, you failed, right? Like, it was kind of absurd after a little point. Um, I have one friend, he's a previous manager of mine, and we chatted a bit um, during this process, and he was trying to you know, give me advice and referrals. Um, and at one point, I said, you know, it's getting pretty clear that this industry doesn't want me. So I'm, I'm about ready to leave. Like, I'm going to call it. I'm just going to throw in the towel. And he was surprised. And then I was surprised that he was surprised. I was like, do you not see me struggling over here? And I think, I mean, I think his surprise came from a good place. Like, he knew, like, I'm really good at what I do. Um, and so I think he was like, wait, obviously you belong. But it sure didn't feel like that in that moment. It did not feel like that. Um, so that's when I kind of 
I don't know, some ideas that I had had about my career in this industry, they all just kind of broke into disparate pieces. And I, the, the visual here is kind of like, um, hopefully enough of you are familiar with Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. There's the book, there's the movie. The most recent Disney movie, the scene where you know Aslan has been killed and he's tied on this stone table and what is it, Lucy and Susan are like, well, there goes, there goes our path. We have no hope anymore. Like, that was our path. It was him being there, and now he's not there, and well, okay, you know, that was, that was the only way forward. But then the table cracks, and they're like, holy shit. All of our ideas of how this life would go are just being thrown out the window, and now we get to think a little more creatively about this. Like, there's more opportunity than we, we were limiting ourselves before. We didn't realize it. But now that that old mindset has literally been broken, we can see what else is out there. And I realized that I had very much tied my identity to the industry and finding my place in it. But the industry doesn't have a soul. <laughs> it's not human, right? It can't give me my flowers. Um, and it also can't appreciate the best parts of me because the best parts of me don't fit on a checklist. The best parts of me are what make me human and allow me to interact with and connect with the other humans around me and create these beautiful, wonderful systems. Um, and so kind of a, yeah, actually, I'm gonna go back to quoting uh, Chris Ori here. He said, I was very good at what I did. I was a great designer. I was a great design manager. I really deeply understand player behavior, player needs, and the business of games. There is a joy in doing something that you are really good at, and I miss that feeling. But I feel an incredible freedom not having the whims of some tech exec be in control of my livelihood for the first time in a decade. Chris has left the video game industry for now. I linked the article. I think he's like running a, like an auto body shop, I think. Forget, sorry. But yes, so that was, let, so let me, let me reread this. I kind of killed the vibe. Um, but I feel an incredible freedom not having the whims of some tech exec be in control of my livelihood for the first time in a decade. And so I went through this process of like, okay, I had tried to be accepted by this faceless industry for so long. I'm not gonna work on that anymore. Like I still want employment because you know, paychecks and healthcare are nice. Um, but not because I need it to like give me value as a person in my community and my family or even in my networks, right? Like I have lots of friends in this industry and I love them and they love me and we respect each other and we can do cool stuff together and that is irrespective of whatever is going on around us. So this brings me to acceptance. Um, and I've accepted that, you know, probably none of the dreams that I had 10 years ago when I entered this industry are gonna happen, at least not in the ways that I originally envisioned because there's a lot of splintering going on. <laughs> um, and even though that sounds sad, it's not only sad. I think there's, there's another concept I really appreciate, which is this concept of holding two seemingly opposing truths, but at the same time an imbalance. So it's like, yes, okay, it is sad that I had expectations and those expectations have changed in ways that were painful to undergo. And it's really exciting to now have more freedom to look at more things that I could do, more ideas that I could have. Like I have a lot of energy. Where can I put it? Um, so, and, and, and one thing that I know is true about me and I believe is true about most of you is like I'm devoted to people. I'm devoted to the humans. And so <laughs> dehumanizingly, I'm still an excellent employee <laughs> because I go to work every day and I wanna have fun. I wanna build cool shit, right? Like most of us do. Um, I want to enjoy working with the people I work with. I want to solve interesting problems. I love root cause analysis. Like, it is so fun. And like, we're still allowed to have fun at work and maybe not tie your identity to it in that way, right? Not look to an industry or even a company to say, okay, now you're good enough to get a promotion. We'll give you one. It's like, I was good enough for that three years ago, man. You're behind the times. I know what I'm worth. Um, so, a couple examples. This, I think, is from the Stack Overflow survey. And it was funny because, um, so I guess, yeah, so not happy at work is the top one, complacent at work, and then happy at work. And I saw an article that said, like, oh, 80% of people are unhappy at work. And I was like, no, I think complacent is great. Complacent's amazing. 
Like, yeah, I go to work. Most days I have fun, some days are stressful, right? So it's not like perfect, I'm not drinking any Kool-Aid, but like I have fun and it's fine, it's good. And I still get to build cool stuff. Um, this next one is a little confusing. The contents of this card are not at all a part of my talk, it just says choice up here, but I do want to give a quick shout out to this game, sorry. Sidebar, this game is called The Game of Wolf and it's a very fun trivia game, highly recommend it. You can play with as few as four people. You can probably go up to as many as you want. It's really, really great with six. Just look it up. It's good. It's fun. You'll love it. Promise. OK, but back to choice. <laughs> um, so yesterday, um, Jason Brand talked about the power of choice. And there is power in choice, right? He's right. I think we know this. And in a layoff, you have no choice. So layoffs are a power move in that way, kind of asserting dominance in that way. And quite frankly, it still hurts to see LinkedIn messages from people who worked at or currently are at my previous employer who laid me off, right? Like, oh, I just got this promotion and everyone's congratulating them. Oh, I just shipped this, you know, this next phase of the product and everyone's happy about it. Or even, hey, I'm so excited I had, you know, six years whatever at this company, now I'm leaving for a new whatever. I didn't get to do any of that. I didn't have a choice in any of that. Um, and I think choices are what make us human, the ability to make them. You know, does free will exist is a very common debate. Um, and I think it always comes back to at least some form of yes, at least a little bit, right? Because like, yeah, without free will, like, what are we doing here? <laughs> like, you've got to have choice. Um, layoffs are also very intensely personal related to that loss of agency. Um, and that's what makes them especially devastating. Um, and it's also a weird like mind fuck because it's like, okay, not only do you lose, you know, this job, but you like lose permission to provide for yourself, right? Like, oh, you're not allowed to take home an income anymore. You're not allowed to access insurance, right? You're not allowed to pay your rent or your mortgage. It's bizarre. It's really, really bizarre. Um, and it felt like, again, like, oh, I might lose my home because someone with five houses decided I wasn't valuable anymore. Um, I know someone who received a layoff notice shortly after coming back from bereavement leave for losing her husband. I know someone, or know of someone, who passed away about a month, month and a half after being laid off. Don't know their circumstances. Um, anecdotally, from talking to various people who've been laid off for various companies and um, it seems like layoff groups tend to have a higher concentration of parents, people coming back from parental leave or on parental leave, than the larger, right, the ratios are off in terms of the population of the, the layoff group and the population of the company at large. So layoffs are a little, little dehumanizing. Um, but now we're going we're gonna to we're gonna swing back up. I think, I think we did a good job of holding sadness and grief and emotions. We're not papering over it, but we are going to talk about how we can support each other in those moments. So yeah, if you're friends with someone, check in with them and do it liberally. Text them a few times a week. You know, message them on Slack. Ask them for updates. Send them encouraging notes. If you're just in someone's network, be liberal with referrals, right? Offer to help with interview prep and be specific. I'll talk about that again in the next slide. I have a good example of that. If you're a hiring manager, don't try to trick people. Like, this is not a fun game, <laughs> right? Um, and also, like, don't expect people to wax poetic about how great your company is and how much they love it. Um, like, do you want to be the rebound relationship? <laughs> or do you just want somebody who's good at their job? And then also give feedback. I know so many companies are scared about this because of liability or whatever. Give Zapier does it, or Zapier, sorry, I don't know how you pronounce it. But like, so ask them. They figured it out. It's not that hard. They do it really well. That was actually extreme. Thank you, Zapier. <laughs> Helped me a lot. <laughs> um, super valuable feedback can really help someone who's getting back into the interviewing game. Again, like I had been at my employer for four, four and a half years. I had, I had interviewed like a little bit here and there, but never that seriously. It, it, it's, a, it's a game, it takes practice, it's a skill, right? It takes practice, so give feedback. Um, so going back to being specific, um, so this is a cartoon 
um, by someone named Emma. She doesn't list, or they don't list their, their last name. Um, and it is a cartoon about like a domestic partnership and labor sharing. Um, but I think it gets home the point well in terms of when you're offering support or help to someone to be specific because there is a mental load to having to ask for the help that you need. And sometimes you're too tired to know to ask for the help that you need, right? So this example, again, is like, oh, you didn't do the dishes. Well, you never asked. Okay, well, but, because I'm doing 12 other things, right? <laughs> like, um, so rather than, hey, let me know if you need interview help. How about, hey, I have a good system design interview problem in my, in my notes. Let me know if you want to practice system design. I have the question ready to go. Right? Or hey, if you want to practice interviewing, I've got like five go-to behavioral questions I ask. We can do like a mock interview, right? Be specific. All right, so moving on to build. This one is gonna, we're gonna expand outside of job searching and industry. Um, yeah, surround yourself with community. Make sure you have it online and offline. Um, because how do you keep going when a job or a career kind of loses that sparkle, right? It's not magical anymore. The Kool-Aid's no longer red. For me, the most important thing is the people around me, like I said, right? I work hard to make sure that my team has fun. We get told what we have to build and we get to decide how, right? The how can be fun. We're all, I think a lot, most people I've worked with in this industry, we're, we're, all, we're curious, we like building things. That's why Honeycomb's giving away Lego sets. Right? Like you can still do that and you can still have fun. Just, you know, don't tie your identity to it. Um, and then outside of employment, like what is it that you dream of? In the words of Marie Kondo, um, what sparks joy in your day to day? Can you make more space for more of that? <coughs> um, what can we pour our energy into that no one else has the power or the authority to take away from us? Um, so the next um, the last few slides I'll share here are about more ideas on how to think about community and how to find purpose in building more things around us. Um, so this book was at the beginning, oh gosh, yeah, <laughs> but Designing Your Life, How to Build a Well-Lived Joyful Life. It's a very short, quick, easy read book. It guides you in brainstorming about how might you combine your skills and interests to like do cool stuff and what you can think of. So it's pretty good. Um, did you know we're in a loneliness epidemic? People have a hard time making friends. Um, there's a book on how to make friends. It's a lot newer than uh, Andrew Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, I think more useful as well. Um, so this is good. Um, so in Delaware, a running joke with Delaware is that so many people like grow up there and stay there that when you meet someone, you ask them, oh, what high school did you go to? So having moved there, I'm like, how do I make friends? <laughs> Um, in this kind of in this kind of place, um, so I got this book. Um, I have one potential like close friend, and I told her, "I want to be better friends with you." And here's a book I'm reading, and what it has told me I should do. <laughs> and she said, "That's a great idea. I'm going to text you more. So be explicit. Like, right? We all want connection. There are more people out there." Um, this concept of third spaces, third places, right? So you have your work, you have your home, and then what's that third space you go to? Often coffee shops or bars. Do you have enough third spaces in your area? If not, maybe you start one. Maybe you add one. Um, an organization I love is Strong Towns, which is about making our towns more acceptable and connected so that we can have stronger communities and care about each other a little bit more. Um, so I recommend looking up their stuff, really cool research out of them. Um, democracy in retrograde is about how to work with the system of politics. The funny thing here, I know this is like dangerous to say, because we've been told, we've been conditioned, oh, don't talk about politics, it's impolite, it's rude. Okay, well, I think it's impolite that my kid has a higher risk of asthma because of the company that's 10 miles away that's allowed to put whatever they want into the air. Like, I think that's rude, right? Um, so maybe you think it's a little rude that <coughs> there's an increased rate of uh, people walking on the street getting run over by cars who are driving on the street. Maybe you want to do something about that. Um, the last talk, and I apologize, didn't write down um, his name, talked about open source, how the government funding into open source is not a thing. Maybe it could be. Maybe it could be, right? Like talk to your city council, county council, state legislator, whatever. Someone, friend that I'm staying with, shout out to Katie, told me um, Colorado apparently does like, um, it's very common to do, uh, what is it called, when you give money back after taxes. It's like, oh, we had, we had too much, have, have some money back. 
Maybe that could be put into some open source projects that the state's using. I don't know. Look at it. Figure it out. I can tell you that if they're good, <laughs> the, the, more, the closer to you legislators, right, city, council, state, they love talking to people. They want to hear your ideas. And if you come and you're like, hey, here's this research. Here's the thing we could do. They're like, oh my god, thank you. Like They want to know what's important to you so that they can also improve these systems that govern all of our daily lives. Last shout out, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. <clears throat> this is, uh, this is my, my selfish uh, ask. Look into being a CASA. So a CASA stands for a Court Appointed Special Advocate. And when I talk to people about foster care, they immediately say, oh, I should be, yeah, I, get, I could look into being a foster parent. I'm like, no, don't. <laughs> like, uh, and again, soapbox, come talk to me later. I'll give all the nuance. But definitely look into being a CASA. So a CASA is sort of like the foster care systems equivalent of like the Big Brother, Big Sisters program. So you are a volunteer advocate for a child as they go through the tumult of experiencing the foster system, whether that's, you know, moving from foster home to foster home or foster home to trying to, you know, reunite with their birth parent and then maybe there's a relapse into addiction and then they go back to a foster home and you are that constant. So, yeah, good, good, uh, good program to look into. Um, last one, I do need my phone for this because I took it off my notes. Um, but I want to read a quote by one of my favorite podcasters who's basically a therapist, um, Jessica Lignato, and her, her podcast is linked on my resources slide. So she says, quote, this is where I want to remind you of something that is really key, which is <clears throat> when we go through challenging transits, when we go through challenging times, those very challenges are your path. Whatever problems you're experiencing, from living through a climate crisis to having a hard time with your bestie or whatever else, late stage capitalism to not finding a comfortable pair of shoes that also look really cute with that dress, I don't know. All the problems, they're your path. They're not a distraction from your path. They're your path. Your choices are a reflection on you. How you choose to engage or not is a reflection on you. It's all your path. And there is so much freedom in that reality because challenging days happen. Mistakes are made. Struggles are life. Instead of feeling like, oh, I'm being ripped away from what I'm meant to be doing, it's valuable to understand that you can't actually be ripped away from what you're meant to be doing. Whatever it is that you're doing and wherever it is that you find yourself, it is the path. How you choose to engage is the path, and your path doesn't have to be anything like my path or their path or her path or whatever. And sometimes you can choose to change it, and sometimes you can't, such as life. And coming to a level of acceptance helps with boundaries, end quote. And I think also freedom. So I hope you heard that potential, um, the potential for potential in this talk and the potential for freedom. Our industry is changing, it's gonna keep changing. But we're all human and we're all here and we can support each other through that change. And we can hold the, the dual truths which are, you know, having one dream taken away from you is devastating. And also you can build another one. <laughs>